Hi, Steve. How are you doing this fine day? Good, good. Yeah. So we left off um, last week with um, talking about strongman and, and things like that. So let's touch on things moving ahead a little bit and um, how you got involved in the coal race, which is a local thing to you up, uh, up in Yorkshire, um, and how we went about training you for it and getting you to, what, number third place, was it, or fourth place? I can't remember now. Um, I think it was either third or fourth in my class and fifth overall. Yeah. So it's, a, it's a pretty good going thing. So, yeah, start off, let, t- t- tell the listeners or viewers um, what the coal race entails. And uh, it's just down the road from you in Dewsbury or, yeah. or whatever. So. It, it's, it's a traditional event. It's been going for over 50 years. And you run just over a kilometre course uphill with... 50 kilos of coal on your back, which is eight stone. And it started with an argument in a pub between two coal men, basically saying one was faster than the other. So they decided to go out and race each other to prove a point. And then it just took off from there. And it's got bigger and bigger and bigger to the point now where there's not only men's, two men's races for, or heats, there's the women's, there's the masters and there's the children's events as well. I mean, it's huge. I mean, you've been up yourself, you see what the crowds are like. Yeah. Well, I've, I've, I've come into it. I, I, the first time I came along, I was interested in the photography and everything. I did such a good job with the photography um, that I was invited back as a, a press photographer uh, for two years running to, um, to do that. But unfortunately, the last couple of years I've been working, so I haven't made it up there for it because it's on a bank holiday and I have to work bank holidays. Um, but yeah, it's been it's, it's, it's a good event. It's always been a big, big thing, you know. So, oh yeah, I mean it's it's such a local tradition for um, Easter bank holiday Monday. Um, it brings everybody out. It's um, a lot of, you know people come from all over the world to race there. You know, yeah, I've known people America, Holland, New Zealand. <laughs> Makes it's it onto such TV. A worldwide appeal. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it does make yeah. it onto TV, even down here. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> yeah, it does make it onto uh, TV and things. So. I think it got onto Transworld Sport as well one year. Yeah, and um, well a couple done. of other places like that. There's a sports program that were on German TV that came over a few years back in did a long one um, and the chap that does the sport on BBC News he came over I think it was last year a year before um, and had a go so it's a long Ben old... Fogel oh yeah he's another one that's done it he did it uh, six or seven years ago I think okay. it was maybe maybe it's before I went along to it then yeah, yeah, yeah so, of course it's what, just over a, a mile of, of it, about, isn't yeah it? it's, it's it's a thousand and twelve meters to be exact. Okay. And it is a hip, big hill. I've walked up it even without a cold <laughs> sack on my back, and it's a hard old yeah. slog up there. You, you've two hills. You've just, the first one, which is probably about two, two and a half hundred meters. Then it flattens off on the main road. You turn off the road, <laughs> and then you start going onto the second hill, which is a slow, gradual climb, and then it hits a really steep climb. Once you get over the top of that, then you've got another two, three hundred meters of a straight sprint to finishing line. And the finishing line is the maypole itself. And your time is only logged when the sack hits the ground at the bottom of the maypole. Yeah, I remember. I'm, I'm just going to say, when we uh, put this up on the uh, on, on the website, I've uh, I found some pictures of one of the races. So I'll put a couple of pictures up. It might not be you, but it will show certainly the grimace and strain on people's faces when they're getting to that point just know, short of the hill. I, I'll send you that one that you took of me um, okay. in 2012 and then you can put that up because yeah, that was sure. a corker. I mean, that was snot and spit everywhere. It's not, uh, not, not a nice look. <laughs> so <laughs> when, when, when we started training you for that, I mean, obviously it's, 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 it's not something that we normally do. You can't just stick a backpack on and stuff. There's a lot of, uh, lot of work into it, which is how um, we looked at some very various training methods. And I remember you going out in the mornings, either just after work or just before work and, and, and running yeah. along the grass and stuff. Um, but also getting into some of the obstacle races that you've done um, and paras and, and, and things. So do you want to sort of touch on some of the yeah, we, challenges and things? Yeah, um, for the core race, we, 
we went up and I filmed it the first year, uh, the year before I did it. And we put together just so that you could look, everybody could look at what, what it entailed. And we got some footage of them coming down the final couple of hundred meters. Um, and then we put together a plan, which was going to be five years to get me from zero to winning it. And then each year there was a different goal and target that I had to meet um, to get to that five year plan. That The sixth year was an optional year where if I'd won it in a reasonable time on year five, we were then going to go for the world record which is yeah. 406. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then part of that that we did was, because I'd, it was years since I'd run, come everything with bodybuilding and strongman and that, I'd just done no running. I did a lot of cycling, but it's not the same. So we started off with getting me used to doing a 5K run and then to put more physicality into it so that we were working the whole body then we started doing some of the Spartan races for the obstacle courses and the challenges that they threw. And also so that I wasn't suffering with a lot of repetitive strain injuries. Yes, exactly. But then, I mean, we, we, and we did pretty well. I mean, years one to three of, of that plan, we, we, we got you to that third or fourth spot. And obviously yeah. things happened. All targets with, uh, were met. Yeah, <coughs> things happen. I mean, the first time for fasciitis and everything yeah. that you had and stuff that's what yeah, I'm, got I'm, into I'm, in I'm the way of it a little bit. Yeah, unfortunately, I mean, the first race that I ever did, they'd only won group. Um, they had a limit of 40 for the race because roughly that's what um, amount of people you could get across the road where you yeah. do it because the police cordon it off and then everybody goes. Um, Normally they let they used to let about 45, 46 through. Um, and the goal was to get in the top 50, which we did. And we did that even though two weeks before I had a calf strain, yes, which is, you know, and, and the day that you came up, everything was I, uh, I, I think I might even have pictures of the taping as well. Yeah, I have actually still got them, so I can send you them send over as well. Oh, yeah, please do. Um, and... But all we did was it was just a simple case of first half of the race, just hold back. And then if the calf is holding, go for it. And then I felt fine. I mean, physically, that was the strongest out of all the races that I felt muscular wise, not cardiovascular. I, I really was suffering. Um, and I knew that once I got over the second hill and started picking people off, it was just so easy that way. Um, and I think, yeah, I think I got 18th on the first, the first yeah, it was, race. It was, it was still a respectable. That was, that, that was with the busted calf. I mean, even now, I do think that if the calf hadn't have gone, I actually could have made well into top 10. Yeah, I think so. That's is good. And then year two, we got a little bit better. Yeah, year two, we, we sort of pulled back on the weights a little bit whilst we were doing the coal race training. And one thing that I changed was... Uh, for the first year I was doing my weights first and then going out and doing uh, a circuit with sack around where I was yeah. just some basic interval training year two I was getting up about three o'clock in the morning and going down onto the local field and doing all my cardio down there in rain snow pitch black and whatever well. um, coming back going to work then if there was a weight session, I'd either do it that evening or the next day. <clears throat> but we, we split everything up a bit more on the uh, second year. Just to remind everyone, you're a postman anyway, so you're covering a lot of ground uh, as part yeah. of, or you are a postman, but you're covering a lot of ground on your feet during, during yeah. that all, all the way through your, your, your working day, as well as the pre-training and the, the weights in the evenings and stuff. So it's quite a high yeah. intensity um, well, st I was still doing nine, ten miles a day walking um, on top of anything else that I ever did um, that way. We I mean, the, the, fir the funny thing is that, I mean, I was so unfit on the first one. It was it was a shock. And I remember um, we, I were down, it was snowing. And 
I um, I looked at my heart rate monitor, hmm. and it said 226 beats a minute. Okay. And I'm thinking, this isn't good. Um, and I mentioned it to a friend, and his um, his dad's a massive cyclist, and he, he wouldn't believe him at all. So he went out and bought me a polar heart rate monitor. About two weeks later, I clocked it at 240. <laughs> Yeah, 240 beats a minute. And that particular day, I started to lose my vision. Yeah, it's an extreme uh, you know. <laughs> point, point, point to get to. But this, <laughs> this, this shows and explains somewhat what the, the coal race does to people and how you couldn't really take what would have been normal long distance training or normal sprint training and utilise it on something that's that sort of middle of the road type of event but with a 50 kilo sack on your back and yeah. at a lot faster pace than, than things like the paras 12 and, and and the likes yeah um, i mean i think i think for the first race we, we we went in at actually the full 50 kilo straight away yeah, um, yeah. for the others we came in at 25 20 25 kilos and um, starting about four to six months out yeah and then slowly built it up until I were about a month out. And then by that point, I was on the uh, the full 50K. I mean, looking back now, I think if I were to do it again, I would actually come in lower and do a little bit more distance and start building a, a basic cardio base with probably 10 kilos and practice running with the arm, no arms, the arms up in that position where we're carrying it yeah. from a, a much earlier phase than what I did, rather than just it, well, using a basic normal running pattern. If you use, if I'm just say, if, base. If, if you use a, a rucksack, a, a rucksack or a, a body weighted vest or anything, you don't yeah. get into that hands up here position that you need to do when you're running with a sack on your back. And also, when the sacks are, are new and fresh, which is, happens with some of the earlier races. Um, they're a lot stiffer and a lot harder up here. By the time they've yeah. worked through a couple more races and the coals had a chance to break down a little bit, they start to hang a little bit better and, and, and make it a very slightly easier point to, to, yeah. to run for. But it's still this hands-up position, which isn't a very natural position for no. running. You know? And you're also bent over as well, which is it does give you some compression on your lungs so you're breathing in a funny position anyway i mean for me i never raced i never did the core race more than uh, 10 stone five and you're carrying eight stone on your back so i'm literally nearly so double, body, double weight. body weight yes yeah and looking at all the competitors that were did it the year that i did it i think i was the sh one of the shortest and definitely the lightest in that um, person there yeah and there's no weight category. It's just no, now no, no. You, you've got the open race, which is two races, two heats. And then you've got two heats for the Masters. And that's it. And Masters is over 40s. But some of, some of the Masters runners that I've seen in, in recent years, the ones that have just stepped across from the Opens to the Masters, are still putting in and running at those times. One of the guys, in fact, does yeah. both runs. Um, yeah. He, he did, yeah, John crazy. Hunter. Yeah. yeah. Crazy he retired to... last year, I think it was. I think last year was his last race uh, where he officially retired. He's won it eight times. Would have won it nine times. And I do remember the race. He actually slipped okay. on um, a manhole cover All right. in rain. But he's also, I mean, if you look at the guys that are, I mean, your build doesn't really contest very well well to what we were putting your body through you know your, your your height and body weight these guys some of the the, the, the better uh, or the, the, the yeah. more advanced runners are maybe more long distance runners fell runners people that um yeah. have that longer body shape a little bit leaner a little bit more wide whereas you come from fast twitch muscle fibers from from the bodybuilding and things and having to um re yeah re, retrain your body to, to, to yeah. pretty much to cope with that Height-wise, I, I will probably say I'm losing a good six inch to a lot of the winners, and definitely four stone, five stone. Yeah, I'm giving away. But I, I remember the young guy with the curly hair that runs it sometimes in suits and sometimes not. I can't remember oh, his name. Yeah, um, Joel. He, he, yeah, Joel. That's it. He, um, he's probably one of the the physically strongest looking of, of the the runners, um, which yeah. is probably why he's managed to do it. 
you know, when, when he's run two or three times and goes back and helps some of the lesser runners yeah. to, to creep up and everything, where I'd be on the floor panting for oxygen and, and everything. Well, and, he, he, yeah, he, he does it purely for uh, raise money for um, a charity. I think it's something to do with Smile. A um, couple of years back, he actually did all six races. He did all the women's races and all the men's races. I think that's the one and I remember. Then, and then one year, he actually did it with 100 kilos on his back. I don't remember that one. That would have been an yeah, interesting one. I don't think one. you were up that, that year. No, that must have been. There was probably, I've been up what, four years and I've been working at Pure Gym for three and a half now. So since then, I haven't been up, haven't been able to get up for it. And <clears throat> with the um, obstacle races, you did the paras as well. We, we touched on that yeah. right at the very beginning. In fact, I, don't, I think that might be the one we didn't actually manage to record. But you did a fairly good time on that. That was running yeah. with. Um, uh, was 35 that with, pound backpack yeah. and the in distance. boots and long trousers. <clears throat> and the distance is? 10 mile at uh, Catrick uh, Barracks. Which is nice and local to you. A nice camp up there. I know two or three yeah. strong, yeah. Strong, men, yeah. strong women that train up there and live up that way. Yeah. So, yeah. You, you run on the, the, on the exact route that the paras have to do with themselves, and it's, it's a lot of ter different terrain. It's up and down the hill. Some of it's concrete. Some of it's a bit muddy. Um, they really do test you. Um, and, and the, the obstacle it, races it, that you did with Spartans, I believe, yeah? Yeah, I did the Spartans and a, a couple of others. Um, didn't night you get races. Invite, didn't you get an invite into the that, that, that Premier League thing where you had a chance to go to more of the races or... Do a lot yeah, more yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think I got tenth in the Yorkshire one up here, and I actually sprained my ankle during that race, so I, I would have got uh, higher. Um, and then that qualified me for going into the Spartan Beast, which is a half marathon, and we did that down at uh, Brands Arch. Oh, okay, yeah, so much closer to me. Didn't know about that, although I might have even managed to come along and cheer you on, but uh, you never know. I might have been doing strongman or something at the time. Probably, yeah. Um, and then I did some night races as well um, with a company. Um, that's scary. It's in thrill. It, it's in you know, it's thrilling in some respects, but running through woods with, with just a torch on your head, it's. I can't imagine testing. wanting to do that very much. Um, it makes you think, especially when you're, you're only 20 minutes in and you see somebody on the floor and it looks like they've got a broken ankle. Yes, that's not a good thing, is it? <laughs> no, no. I'm back but in that, my... That was, I think that was the race I did um, as a test just before the last uh, co-race that I did. Mm -hmm. That was part of the, the training to see how far I could actually push it coming out of the uh, the winter training that we'd done. Yeah. And that was about six weeks, I think, six to eight weeks before coal race. Right. That's a good time. Um, I was going to say, um, right back when I was doing more cardio stuff and pre-Strongman, pre-Portugal and everything, we actually got involved in some of the bigger obstacle races, which incorporated swimming, abseiling, um, canoeing, running yeah. not too much running because i don't like that too much but we still had to put some of that in um and um, a mountain bike ride which we did up around high wickham which was really good and that incorporated like a, a road bikes uh, like a time trial um there was a mountain bike um ride as part of it uh, there was a canoe race um and a swim and an abseil um, which was quite good fun. But this was all way before like the Spartan challenges and stuff. I don't think anyone yeah. has even heard of anything like that. Something that we did as part of our training for triathlons and stuff just to break it up. I raced mountain bikes at the time as well. So I wanted to find something that would get me on the road and get me on the mountains and you know, bring in some of the other bits and pieces of yeah. sport that I like doing, you know, climbing and, and, and mountain biking and uh, climbing and abseiling and stuff was some of the other things that I did at the time as well. I used to climb quite a lot. Um, and they're good fun. I, so, yeah, I know a few yeah, people that do I mean, those and ultra races and things. So. Yeah, I mean, I enjoyed it because it, it, it gave me something to do um, cardiovascular-wise as a means to get better at coal race. I mean, as I said at the beginning, I, were, I'm over, I was over 40 when I started 
and I was getting faster year on year on year. So we were obviously heading in the right direction. Absolutely. Um, you know, yeah, we, I mean, we were playing about with um, the types of training that we were doing with the various sprints um, and the various and interval stuff whilst trying to maintain the strength that I needed because of my weight. It was definitely to be able to carry this. It was definitely an interesting area from, from my point of view to try and program something like that. As I say, it's, it's, it's not long distance running and it's not the same stuff that we would, I would train you with if we were running a half marathon or a te, even a 10 or 15 K. And then also it's not the same as getting a sprinter out and then running a hundred meters. You know, you, you're basically yeah. running almost a sprint or a, you know, a thousand meters um, with coal on your back and up a hill which is just yeah. completely out, out of it so we, we we experimented i think we did okay with a lot of the ideas that we had in terms of training yeah. and obviously we proved that with the way we did it and we, we listened and learnt with, with with your body um going I mean, forwards a little bit um from that then obviously the last couple of races you're unable to do because you got plantar fasciitis plantar fasciitis yeah in, um about eight weeks before the um the, the race that I was going to do. I mean, the testing that I'd done for that race um, was, was going to take me a minimum of at least 30 seconds faster than the previous year. Um, I came in at 5 minutes 36 in 2012 and the, I could have come in better. That was the year that I had the adrenaline dump on the uh, start line yep. and my legs went... That's that that was thing. awful. I was absolutely gutted. I never experienced anything like that before, ever. Well, and that was a serious fight. I mean, the guy that was in front of me, I kept up with him for probably the first 400 metres. And I knew if I stayed with him, I'd get a good time. But as we got closer and closer to the, the second hill, I could feel myself going. And it was just a case of, right, dig in keep this pace going yeah. and make sure nobody else passes you. And that's what I did. I think also, I mean, touching on the, the, the psychological side of this sort of event, it's, it's a very big mental process. And, and I, I remember doing the very first ever, uh, I think it was a biathlon I was doing. It was a, one, of, one of my first races. And I got carried up with the, the, the stream of everything. So I'm, I'm, I'm a better cyclist than I am a runner. And in this particular race, we started off with a run and finished with a bike ride for some reason. And it was exactly that. I, um, I got there, the adrenaline kicked in, and I ran off with the, 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 the lead pack of runners. By the time I'd got halfway through the run, and these guys were now getting ahead of me, I was starting to hit my wall and starting to blow out a little bit. Ended yeah. up coming into the, 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 the bike ride um, second from last. Luckily, I got back on the bike, and I have got into my groove and, and pulled back to about... 40 places out of this is about 130 people and I pulled back to about 40 of them so what's that 70 people I overtook on the bike but obviously half of those people or, or 70 of them or 140 of them almost or 139 of them all <laughs> beat me on the run and it was purely because I'd sat there and not listened to myself and not played the game and, and set off steady. I set off with the, the you know the, the the best runners that were out there, and and, and I, you know, I had my own for the first half of the race. But as soon as I hit my wall, that completely blew me. And you know I, I, we yeah. we run halfway there, and, and and the second half on the way back, and you're sort of running past people, and they're just coming past you and overtaking you as as they get in there. And you think, am I really cut out for this? Then you get to the end, get on the bicycle, and I hit my groove. And even even when I did the the, the, the transition. Um, because I was so far back, I didn't really put a lot of effort into a speedy change at that time and got, on, got my shoes on, got my bike, everything in the clips and ready to go, got on the bike, made sure I had the cycling shorts on and everything. And of course, as soon as I was into my, my prime area, it was great. And I was pedaling away and overtaking people. I think I even got a little bit lost at the end and still managed to pull back like 70 or 80 places. But um, yeah, it's, it's think, an interesting thing mentally, you know? Yeah, I think... What bizarrely, I think what happened, what helped me was the fact that through all my weightlifting and bodybuilding and that, you, you build up some some mental resilience to pain, and you know you have to dig in, even when a rep is hard mm -hmm. or 
a set is really rough. And he, I, I switched straight into that mentality. As I say, once I saw his feet pulling away, because obviously you bent over, you can't, you know, I could never look, look. So I used to just see bottom half of somebody. Once I saw them feet pulling away, I knew if I tried to keep up, I were going to die at top at second hill. You know, if I actually got up. Um, so I just let him go and I stuck to my own pace. I mean, even then I were, I were chuffed. I came in, yeah, I think it was third on on my heat. And then there were two people that beat beat me uh, my time on second heat. So, so, I mean, as I say, I were chuffed. I mean, we, we met the target, which yeah. was to get top five. We, we were definitely right in there. So, obviously, you, you, you then had the plantar fasciitis and everything. Um, and we jump a, a big step forward to sort of now, I, I suppose. So, um, I believe you're not working or doing the same job as you were doing before, which is probably a big relief on your, on your feet, yeah. at least. Oh, um, definitely. As, as well as anything else. Um, what are you doing at the moment in, in, in terms of training or, or where are you going? I mean, I, 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 we, we touched right back in the very first conversation that we had that we didn't record about you doing some Olympic lifting and things. And I, I know your sons both play rugby or just one of them. I can't remember. Just now. one. Yeah. And they both lift. Yeah. As well. Both so, lift. You, know, you can lead, lead us into to what you're doing there and, and how you're getting on with your son that lifts or both lifts. Um, yeah. I got, I got into Olympic weightlifting, like we said, after I couldn't race anymore. And to be honest, I still wanted to do, come back and do the race, but I didn't expect to take five years nearly to get rid of the plantar fasciitis. I mean, it was an absolute nightmare. And a lot of that I put down to the job. Yeah. That, you know, the foot can never heal when it's doing that amount of repetition. Um, so I took up the, the Olympic weightlifting so that I could get stronger and more mobility to be able to run and to be able to create that power because when when the foot went i couldn't even squat for probably 12 months could not put any weight on my back to do anything like that the most i could do was um one leg uh, bulgarian lunges but right. with no weight at all that's as much load as i could put on the foot okay for a long time um, and eventually, I ended up competing. I did the um, Northern Masters, and I won my um, age and weight class first Good. time out. That's nice to know. And what about your sons? Or both um, they, they competed, or any? The, my eldest has done three competitions, I think. Okay. Um, and the young, the youngest, he. Obviously, with his when he had his um, scholarship, is it scholarship? Yeah, with, pretty much. Uh, Wakefield Trinity. He he obviously spent a lot of time with me over years training, um, and then went more into Olympic style stuff because they use the hybrid movements. Yeah. Um, to create power in rugby players. Of course. And how is his rugby going? No, he decided he didn't want to be a professional. And uh, it's, it's a hard six, yeah about six say, months before he was um due to get to know if he were going up to the academy he just said enough's enough it, it's I, hard um, they pushed quite hard um, oh yeah I remember. funny enough he loved it i mean he were training five days a week right uh, and one one game so they were only he were only getting one day off the first year right um, and that were the fittest and quite possibly the strongest he, he ever was. Um, at, at, fifth, at 14, I think he was, 14 and a half, he was doing five reps with 120k back squat. Yeah. That's right. That's a good game. Which, which is not bad for a, for a kid. Well, it's like my nephew also, um, the obviously the real rugby, not the um, stuff you play up north. <laughs> but um, my, my, my nephew is... Um, hit by the Saracens which is local to us and prior to actually being old enough to get into their training squad uh, he was requested to go along and um, attend all their training and things so again it was like a, a pre-scholarship scholarship because they wanted him in there yeah. but he was just a, a year too young he was born in New Zealand had the, the, you know, the Kiwi blood of rugby in his veins I think right from day one excelled massively 
but at the at the time just didn't want to to sort of progress into that. He could have been way up there and, and stuff. I mean, if we we look at his lifting for now, he went into powerlifting um, at under nineteen years old with an under a uh, under a, uh, under nineties body weight. But he was about eighty kilos at the time. Pulled a two ninety deadlift, um, which is pretty pretty good going. Yeah. He went over to um, uh, Romania to to compete at the um, European Championships. I, I, I can't remember which which particular um, corporation it was with, but um, he pulled uh, and just missed a three hundred deadlift out there to uh, and pulled a two ninety for his uh, to get the British record uh, for his yeah. age and weight class. You know, so yeah. Well, I mean, Luke had twelve months off rugby, twelve months, even weights. He he. he stop that altogether because he just said I need a rest um, I want to get down with my schoolwork. I want to pass my exams um, and then I've, during lockdown I just said Are you to sure him, that's a real child? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know really anyone that wants to do well at their exams at that age <laughs> Oh he's he's, he's career minded <clears throat> he really is he knows where he wants to go good, good. Um, and during lockdown I just dug out the old 20 rep squat program and said do you want to have a go? And we did that. And um, at the end of it, I says, right, we'll, we'll test as one rep max, you know, see where we've got. I mean, there's a big difference between getting 20 reps out and and doing a single, but it, we're interested. And it, it cranked out 142 and a half kg back squat. Yep, good stuff. Yeah, you know, so it's, it's still there with him. Yeah, that's good. It's nice to know. Um, I'm going to wind this up here because... I've had these problems with YouTube at the moment. If they go, if these videos go too long, they don't like it and I have to keep editing them back and everything. So thanks very much, Steve. We'll catch you in a little while um, and I'll yeah. speak to you soon.